Hi, Manuel. How are you? Hi, everyone. Okay, so we'll wait a couple minutes for everybody to join us. We're a little light tonight. Well, Hi, Paul. How are you? Well, busy as always. Hey, uh, I wanted to see if are you still teaching um, dual enrollment courses at your high school? Do you want me to put yep. one on the schedule? Say it again. Oh, no. Um, yes, yes, I am. I think we're to you doing a dual enrollment class next year, assuming there's enough students. Okay. Do you want me to put CIS five on the book for the fall? Or do you want to do another course? Oh no, so for the dual enrollment or yeah. Or dual enrollment has to be CIS five and CIS okay. seventeen the second semester. We're not approved for okay. anything else. Okay. Are you, um, you going to give me a class at night? Yeah, I'm working on that now. Once I finalize it tonight, I'll email you. Um, my draft for the schedule has been rejected, so uh, oh, really? I'll, I'll get that to you tonight. Why would yeah. they reject it? So, uh, they want more face-to-face -face classes, so, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and get that to you tonight. Maybe... Are you okay with teaching? Uh, are you can? Do you want to teach Python or do you want to do? Do you want to do just C? CIS thirty A. I could do that. Okay. All right. Let me take a look. Either the C plus plus or the Python one. Yeah, I like C plus plus. That one's easy for me to teach. Okay. Yeah. Let's prep. All right. Okay. Uh, I will try to see if I can add. Um, Mr. McQueed still teaching. Yes, he is. He is. Isn't he uh, yeah. in the seventies? Yes, I don't know, but yes, he is still teaching. Oh, okay. No, he's way older than I am. A few yeah. years older than I am. So, I was just wondering. Yeah, we. Uh, he's still teaching classes. Um, well, we plan for him to teach in the fall anyway. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll touch base with you. I'll drop you an email um, and see, you know, proposal state is, it's really up to the dean and the academic departments to, and uh, so I'll follow up once they approve it. All right, I think we got some people here. Yes, hi, welcome back uh, to CIS 11. Um, and I hope you have a long, wonderful weekend with the holiday. We are gonna pick up where we left off. We are gonna cover the next chapter where we talk about input and output. And then we're gonna come back to the multiplication and division lab um, that we didn't complete last, uh, last week. And so we will pick that up. So we should have enough time to complete most of all the required lab. And then I will also give you lab time to work on your, your team project. Um, that is due the end of the semester. So let me go into screen share. If you can check out Canvas and download the notes and the assignment, we are going to talk about input output today. There is a homework assignment that's going to help you prepare for next week quiz. Or I'm sorry, quiz when you come back from spring break. Next week, we don't have class because we have spring break. Um, and so we won't have a quiz until you come back. Okay. All right, so let me share screen. So make sure we take a look at the module um, for this week, okay? And right now I'm gonna go ahead and show you your notes and we'll do a little bit of lecture and answer the questions. So in this week, we are gonna cover input output. Um, for assembly in other languages, you would be able to um, write programs that would utilize the registers for input and output devices. So for example, in the smartphone, you will have virtual keyboards or in some cases, if you're looking at 
the older phones that have attached keyboard or the keyboard that's mounted on the face of the phone, um, you will need to write instructions um, for how those key the keyboard would be used to uh, for the user to enter the data. So part of von Neumann model that we touched on um, address the area with the input output. So the computer system needs to have some way for the user to enter uh, data or information. Whether it's touchscreen and using virtual keyboard um, or it could be an actual keyboard and mouse, your traditional computer would have the screen as an output for the display and your mouse and keyboard would be your input. Um, we have transitioned from the traditional system and we now would have touchscreen, virtual keyboards, and various things that we would see with smart devices today. So for input and output, the important functionality in the input and output is to be able to, for the user to really interact with the system. And for input, we want to get the information into the computer so that way it can process it. And back in the day, computer system was used for arithmetic calculation. Um, so it would be for um, just to compete, calculate, you know, uh, simple equations all the way to complex equation later on. Now, in order to really get the data that's calculated or computed in the system, out to the user, we can display it on the screen or we can have it printed. We can store it to a storage device like your external USB drive. So the result after it gets processed, um, we need to be able to utilize it. And so here um, we would see that there, there are different type of input devices, right? And this is the basic that would be covered in like CIS 1A or another class. But you would see that keyboard um, sometimes that will be motion detector um, or even your network interface adapter, like your wireless um, card that will be receiving data and it also send data to different type of systems. So we have to look beyond the traditional, the traditional um, input and output. So is smart screen handle in a similar way to a mouse? Yes, so smart screen touch base, it, you know, there are sensors that are built in to be able to detect your finger or gesture or, um, so on a touch screen, it would have a layer to be able to sense your touch on the screen, of course, but it would handle as an input, in, you know, of data. So if I tap on a certain area on the screen to highlight my document, for example, that will be handled with the same instruction as if you would select that with the mouse and highlight it. So there are similarity in how that input is, is being instructed um, and processed for the system. Um, now, depending on how you're using the smart screen or the touch screen, um, if you're using the touch screen with the virtual keyboard, like what you would see with iPads or the tablets, right? Um, that will be handling with the keyboard aspect. So um, it's using heat-based sensor and also pressure-based sensor to be able to sense your touch. Once that signal is activated, it's stored. It it would initiate the register to be able to send the signal to the processor that there is some form of data that's being entered. Okay. So for the output. Now for your touch screen, it will be in both area. You would have a way to do an input, right? Um, and a, a, a way to really output the image or the to display your data on the on a monitor. So in some devices, you would see this as they're both IO. Um, monitor would be on the output if it's not a touch screen. But if it is a touch screen, it's both. Your printer is an output, but if it is an all-in-one device, it's like you would have a scanner, a copier, a printer, a fax machine, all-in-one, those tend to be uh, both input and output. 
So multiple multiple functionality machines, uh, like you know your printer fax copier, etc., you would see that as both. And see how network interface is in both. So network interface as it's sending and receiving information from systems, right? That it will be in both I input and output. So it's I/O. Now your storage, you would see that depending on the type of drives, um, you would see that it will be both. So your hard drive inside the system or your solid state drive, that will be both as we can store data into it or we can extract data from it. Same thing with Blu-ray and DVD or CD burner, and those are legacy now, along with your external drive, like your USB drive that you use to store various documents and um, files. So storage devices, you tend to see them falling into both categories. And when you're using cloud-based drive, that will be both, but all it is is the drive that's connected to a remote system that you use the internet connection to connect to. Okay, so the transfer rate for your average keyboard would be um, 10, oh, I'm sorry, 100 byte per second. And it also varies on based on the type of keyboards. Uh, you know, some people, they customize their keyboard and program their own keyboard, but your, your typical keyboard would be 10, uh, 100 byte per second. Now, the book is written, was written a long time ago. So when you're looking at your storage, right? So here it talks about disk. Really, it is depending on the type of disk that you're looking at, right? Um, the legacy drive would be writing and reading at a certain speed. So that will be 30 megabyte per second for the traditional old drive. But when we're looking at solid state in the modern day, right, that's definitely faster. Even on the hard drive level, that's definitely faster, depending on the interface. So your devices really is, the speed of your device is really correlated to how it's attached to the system, how it's connected to the system, and what path it is connecting to, so that way the processor could see it. So when you're looking at all your um, your peripheral devices, like your mouse, your keyboard, your printer, and so on, many of these are USB based. And it depends on the classification of the USB to, you know, what type of USB it is. So if we're using USB 2, that's slightly slower than the USB 3, and so on. So to really generalize it, we can't really say that, oh, every Every all your disk is going to be functioning at this, or all your keyboard is functioning at a certain speed. We really have to see how it's connected to the system or attached to the system to really say that is the speed. But ultimately, we would know that it would be benchmarking at a certain speed and how the processor sees that. So when the device is functioning externally, um, it is different than when the information is then being processed by the processor. And so it's like this, right? Um, when you have a, a fast car and you're driving on a road that's full of speed bump, you can't really go to the maximum speed. So the device can only perform at its optimal speed when it is connected to an optimal path meaning that your buses like on your motherboard or how it's connecting directly on a certain cable um, is important. And what the processor does is it's going to take that and it's going to use and it won't be operating at the processor speed, but it's going to utilize the clock to really see how it will be able to sync with this device and understand what the device needs would be where the device would ask for instructions or attention, um, it would be a form of interrupt. And we'll touch on that. So let's come back to the first question. It asks you, why is input and output important in computing? And the computer system would not be completed based on von Neumann model without any form of input and output. So if you look at 
in any kind of devices, right, there has to be some form of input and output if it is a computing device. So input and output allows humans to really interface with the system. Or sometimes it could be system to system. When you're looking at automated system or the ASN, right, like um, in your communication network, when you have all of these industrial routers that forward your request from one point to another, those are all automated system. Or sometimes you would see industrial controllers that control uh, nuclear plants and, you know, or your utility facility manufacturing type of companies would use industrial controllers and so on. Those really interface with other systems, okay? So we want to more probably modify this to really interface. So we would have system to system or human to system using input and output. Input allows the user or the system to enter the information to it so it can be processed or computed, okay? The output allows the user to obtain the result from the system after it is being processed. So that's the whole point in using the computer is to use it to process information and so when you're watching a video, right, you have to input your video request, your search, um, and then select the type of video that you want to watch. And as you do that, you're utilizing your input and output devices and also your processor along with storage and other components. So the computer would give you the video that you want right after it receives the data from your streaming servers, and then be able to process that and present you with the data um, on the display on your screen. Okay. Now, in when you're using I/O devices, similar to what you've seen when we work with registers, they have their own specific assigned registers, and Every input and output device would have some form of register. So that would just be a temporary location. It could, you could consider it as a file, but it is a temporary storage where it would hold data so that way it can be transferred from the device into the system so that way the processor can utilize that data for processing. So every device would have two type of registers. One register for the data that's tra being transferred. The second register, it's going to indicate the status. So how does it know when you need to input the data, right? So in assembly program, we've been working with LC3. And for example, I would tell the system to apply a character by using the get C, okay, my get C directive. So when that happens, it's going to wait for the keyboard to have any key strike. And so if the user doesn't teach, touch the keyboard, right, it will just wait forever, okay? So that register, the second register is going to be used to update the status when the the data is being received, right? Or when it needs to be transferred. So one is gonna store data, second is gonna be the status for number two, okay? So those are the two registers that we're gonna look at for the keyboard and the monitor, okay? Now, um, let's come back to the notes for the next part. So here it talks about I.O. devices, okay? And it touches on the two device register as we answer number two. You can find that on page one of your chapter eight notes. The registers are just a group of storage addresses or memory addresses that are allocated for your I.O. device registers. 
and it is alternate to your typical memory locations. These addresses are then being mapped to specific input and output. So Sarah's question earlier, when you're looking at the smart screen or the touch screen, right, how is that going to be, where is it going to be the same as the mouse? So the way that it works is that they would map, right, and utilize the low level instructions similar to what you've seen with the mouse. So that way when you touch it, it consider your touch as a selection of a certain piece of data on the screen. Okay, so that the, the group of memory addresses is mapped to specific input and output for these devices. And that will, that's what the registers are made of. Any question? So now we talk about the status register. So what does it do? So sometimes the processor would tell the device what to do. And so what that when that happens, it's gonna write the it's gonna write to the control register. And as the device might need the processor attention, it might generate an interrupt signal to say, hey, look at me or give me some attention. I'm gonna send data to you, right? So the processor would then need to make sure that what is the task that's needed um, is completed. So it used the, the read status for that register to check if that task is completed. So when I'm using a get C, right? And if the user strike a character on, on the keyboard, that status register is then being updated. So the processor checks that status register by doing a read and see if the character has been received. Okay. And if it's not received, it's just going to continue to wait until that character is input. For the data register, it would be simulated to something like this. So the processor would transfer the data to and from the device. So if you are striking a, a character on the keyboard, like let's say I type in an A because in the program, I would have the user have to input using get C, right? Then it's gonna look at the character that strike and it's going to place that onto the data register. And it's going to read the status register to check if that's completed. Okay, so there's two step in that. So what you see here is when you, the processor would be able to see what is entered for the input. Okay, and in the case if I tell it to out, what's going to happen is then it's going to use the two register for the monitor to be able to output the character on screen and check to see if that's done. All right, any question? Now, for the device electronics, this is when you're looking at monitor, this is gonna be the operation for how we would be able to put pixel on screen. And it would, it would acquire right, data that being stored and also whatever that could be entered from the keyboard, depending on what the operation would be. So if I'm watching or I'm looking at a picture that I have stored on my hard disk drive or my solid state drive, right? It needs to go and pull the data, right? The processor needs to be able to process that picture. And in order to present it to me, it needs to utilize the register for the monitor to give me an asset processor. It's gonna put pixel on your screen and it's gonna, and before that, it's gonna need to pull the file from the, the storage drive and that's how it's gonna be presented on the screen. So as it needs to present it on the screen, it's gonna use the data register and the status 
status register. So that way it would update, right? It would read the status to see if the monitor is presenting that picture on the screen. So for the next part, um, let's take a look at the following section. So when you're working with these devices and to really program them, right, you have to think about how certain type of instructions is used and how that those addresses are being mapped, okay? Now in LC3, we don't do a lot of programming. We don't do programming for the keyboard and a monitor in general. We use the pseudo instructions. We use the the in and the get c and the put to be able to work with the the input and output for your program. But in other assembly language, you might see that you will have to work with input and output devices directly. And so concept wise, you are going to work directly with the registers, similar to what we've seen in the general registers, right? And so when you do, when you use those register, you have to think about how the addresses are being mapped and those addresses are specific to those IO devices and what type of special instructions that you would need to be able to uh, tell the device what to do. There's also timing consideration. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the device are going to be slower than your processor. And so as you can see, the legacy devices, the mouse, the keyboard, the storage, everything is going to, in general, even in modern day, would be slower than your clock cycle, your CPU cycle. So you have to think about how things need to be synchronously and asynchronously. So synchronous just means together, parallel, right? Um, it needs to be the same together. Asynchronously, it could be different in different speeds. So as I.O. devices are slower than your, processing, your processor cycle, you would see that they're operating at a different speed compared to your processor speed, okay? And so therefore, in the notes, author notes that it is part, it's not part of the lock set. So the interaction between your, your processor and your I.O. in general is going to be asynchronous. So when we control the processes at the asynchronous level, we would need to have some kind of rules or protocol or mechanism to make sure that at one point the processor is going to be operating at a certain speed to work with the device. Okay. All right, so let's come back to the assignment now. And we're going to address the next few questions. So for number three, it asks you, how are the device registers identified? Explain each type of identification. They are identified through memory map IO. And those are the registers are mapped to a group of addresses that are allocated to the registers and they are different than your normal memory locations. So that region for the memory is specific for IO. For question four, it asks you for the differences between asynchronous and synchronous data transfer in I.O. devices. So asynchronous, the I.O. devices operate at the speed that's different than the processor, and that will be not in lockstep. Synchronous data transfer, the I.O. devices operated at the same speed as the processor. The data supplied is fixed. It is predictable as far as rate. And so if the CPU reads at a certain number of cycles, it will operate at the same in sync speed with the processor.
any question. So in general, your peripheral devices, and so when we say peripheral devices, that could be, you know, your uh, anything that you would attach or add it on to your system. So when we're looking at your general Windows PC, right, your video adapter, your mouse, your keyboard, um, you know, webcam, uh, you know, additional components that attach and it goes through a bus. And so when we say a bus, that is in general, just a data path on how it could be connecting physically and um, at an abstract level, that bus is going to be used to transfer your data from the device to your processor for processing purposes. Any question regarding synchronous and asynchronous? Then question five, it asks you to describe the type of IO control mechanism and how are they different or similar? So to control the processing for asynchronous, it would require protocol or handshaking mechanism. So handshaking, all that is, is just gonna be acknowledgement between the processor and the, de the device. So they have to agree on, right, how, how fast or slow that data is gonna be transferred because the device is only gonna be at a certain speed, then we are only gonna operate at a certain speed, okay? So, this is the same for everything that you see in computer components. If you buy a sport car and if you're not able to drive it very quickly because you have a narrow road or windy road or bumpy road, then it's only gonna be able to operate at the speed of your road. Your bus path, right, which is the speed for how you transfer your data, and that could be related to cable components, um, motherboard, bus, or you know where you connect your device, and so on. Now, for the data rate, is going to be less predictable in the asynchronous environment. So, if the CPU have to sync with the, the device. In, in order to not miss any kind of data, because if it's writing too quickly, it will likely miss the data. So it has to sync to the, the device speed. So that means that even if you have a super fast processor, and if you have a very slow input and output device, you will never get optimal, okay? So it's like this, and my analogy is sometimes come back to networking because you understand this. So let's say at home, you have a, a router that's able to give you 5G, okay? And, but you have smart devices like your laptop and maybe an old tablet that's not able to connect at 5G. It's only able to connect at 2.4 gigahertz, which is half of the speed. So even if you have a very fast router, your device that's connecting to it is only going to be half of the speed. So overall, if you're using those slow devices, you're only going to connect at half of the speed. You are not using the optimal speed for your wireless router. And that's the same because router, right, is a computing device. It has its RAM, processor, right, input and output, and so on. Any question? Okay. So let's take a look at synchronous a little more and then talk about what is really controlling. How does the CPU control your devices? Okay. 
So in asynchronous, we know that it's fixed, it's predictable, it's using the CPU clock cycle. So it's using a flag, it's called this, this flag is called ready bit. And that is gonna allow it to synchronize for the, the output and the input. So when the user enter a character, this ready bit is set. So when you're using get C, right, in LC3, when the user strike a character, the flag, it turns that ready bit on, okay? So as the, the computer reads the character, when it receives that, right, so when we do a get C, that the character is going to go into our register zero in LC3. And when that happens, the processor, it's going to clear the ready bit. So that way, it's going to free up, right? It's going to say, okay, I'm ready to receive another one. So in the case, if you have get C, get C, get C, get C four time in your program because you want to receive four characters, right? it's gonna clear the ready bit every time it reads the character. So in assembly, we have to move that character, right, from register zero to another register every single time so we can, can, we can store it in for processing later on. So in order to really receive additional character for the keyboard, it needs to sync with it and it's gonna say, okay, I'm waiting for the character once that character comes in, it's going to clear that ready bit. Do you monitor by polling or does it generate the interrupt? So it depends, right? Um, when it's waiting for data, it's going to poll. But when the, the, the device needs the attention for the processor, then it's going to generate an interrupt. We'll touch on that next, okay, in the next section here. So after the ready bit is clear, no character is then typed since the last time, right? And so no additional read is going to take place. Now, if your processor detects the ready bit that's set, it, it is going to be ready for the new character that's being typed. So in the case where we talked about, there are multiple get C, right? And so that means that it's gonna set the ready bit every single time and clear it every single time. Now, the question comes in where there are two mechanisms that we need to implement or see, right, understand that your processor is gonna do a poll. So a poll is that it's gonna check on the device or ask the device and say, hey, are you ready? Are you ready, right? Or the device can generate an interrupt. Think of it like raising its hand. Say, I need your attention. So in polling, all that is, is that the processor is gonna keep checking the status register until the data arrives. And so it's gonna frequently check that register to see if the data is there or if the data or the device is ready to, to have the next data. It's like, you know, the analogy that the author used is, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet, right? For the interrupt, the device is gonna send the signal to the processor when the data arrives. So it really depends on the operation, okay? In the case, if you're looking at network adapter or wireless adapter, okay? If, if the data is expected, then this, the processor is gonna check on it. But as the, the packets, the, your data is coming in in various sequence, right? It needs to reassemble everything together your device, when it receives that, it's gonna generate an interrupt because depending on the protocol. So if we're using TCP, that's expected. If we're using UDP, that's not expected. So it's gonna reassemble that and put, you know, it's gonna uh, uh, open it as it arrives. So it would then 
generate and interrupt. Okay. So now in the olden day, if you're looking at like the Windows um, old operating system, we can actually set the interrupt value for the device itself. But if you if you have a conflict in the values, right? Because if you have two different devices have the same interrupt value, um, then it would cause a conflict. And so that will create issues on Windows system now the new OS, it handles all of that in the back. So it automatically generates an interrupt value for every single device, okay? And if you're familiar with Windows platform, those are called IRQs, and IRQs are managed our way so that way it would use that value to raise the flag to the processor when it needs attention. So when you're looking at your system now, whether you're using a Mac or a PC, right, if you're using the traditional mouse and keyboard, if you don't move the mouse, right, your cursor is still going to be the same on the monitor, okay? But let's say that if I move the mouse, at that time, you are going to generate an interrupt signal, right, to tell your processor that the mouse is being moved. Therefore, it needs to process the cursor being moved on the screen. Okay, but if we're waiting, if you you have an application that's waiting for the user input, then it's going to do a poll. Okay, so as the 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 user type the character, it checks the status to see if that character is inputted, and then what type of data that was inputted. Okay, which character it is. Any question with this? Okay, so for if we're looking at our word size, right, from bit zero to bit 16, if you're looking at the IO register, similar to what we've seen with, you know, the instructions for your opcode, then you would see that the first four bits here are dedicated for the IO. And then the next bits here, are going to be dedicated for the type of device it is, right? And then for the uh, op the operations, okay? So that's how it's broken down in the ISA. Um, and that could be a little different depending on the architecture. So if you're using a different processor or microprocessor like Intel, right, it would be different, okay? So when we're looking at how memory is mapped to input and output, basically it's assigned specific memory addresses for the device register. For example, the keyboard would have its own specific address compared to um, you know, your mouse, your monitor, and so on. Now in LC3, it was really created to simplify your understanding at the low level. So in this particular book, it only mentioned monitor and keyboard, okay? But you get the general idea that it could be a mouse, it could be um, other type of devices, okay? So for the keyboard, the example is shown here that it would use a certain address space that will be mapped to the keyboard and that will be different than what you would have for the monitor, okay? So in the memory mapping for the keyboard, it would use this location, okay? And that is known, and so the hex FE00, that is used for status for the keyboard. And the functionality of that is when one in the keyboard has received a new character that will be bit 15, that's how it's going to be able to check. Okay, so it's using that one bit. For the next location for the keyboard, which is hex FE02, this is used for data. And so it's going to use a byte, which is eight bits. That's going to be able to, st to store the character that's typed on the keyboard. 
And similarly, you would see this for your um, display, your DSR, so display status register, it's using one bit, which is bit 15. That's gonna be used and it's at location hex FE04. Then the data is gonna be a byte or eight bits that will be at hex FE06. So as you can see, right, the location, we would then increment it by two right, in the hexadecimal for the addresses. Any question? Uh, professor, when the location is at FE04, is that when the cursor is blinking? Yeah, so, so it needs that one bit, FE04, it's gonna look at that to see if, if it needs to process that cursor before that, right? before that. So as it process for the cursor, so let's say I'm moving, I'm moving my mouse, right? Uh, then, then after it process the cursor movement on the screen, it's going to clear this location of the bit. Okay. So it's using that bit to check or to wait for an interrupt. So when I move my mouse, it causes an interrupt so that bit gets turned on and it's gonna say, oh, I need to process the pixel to show the mouse moving. Then after it does that, it clears that bit and it's at this location, okay? And because you see it on the monitor, so when we say mouse, it's really what you see on the image in the monitor there, okay? All right, any other question? Okay, so let's answer the next few questions. So for six, we need to identify the memory location for keyboard registers. And we know that KBSR or your keyboard status register is at hex FE00. And then for the data for the keyboard KBDR, that is your keyboard data register, it is at hex FE02. Then the subsequent location, hex FE04 for number seven is for your display status register. And hex FE06 is for data for the display, display data register. So in that process to really display the cursor moving, right, it's, it's using both of these register. It needs to uh, clear the status and check the status that's from FE04. It's also using the data, right, for the monitor that is at hex FE06. And so they always go hand in hand. Status is for it to access, right, the data or not, right? It's use the status to say, oh, I need to retrieve the data and process it. And then after I process it, I clear the status. And that's what the processor does. And this class is about understanding, right, all the low level operation for your computer architecture. Question. Okay. So as we explain that, you can find all of this also in the notes. For question A, it asks you to explain the functionality of the keyboard register. So your status register, your key BSR, it is one bit. It's used for status flag. And that is bit 15. It uses this bit to receive a new character. Your keyboard data register, your KBDR, they are eight bits, bits zero through seven. And zero is the least significant bit. That's the most right. Those bits or one byte is used to contain data that was input. So your character. For question nine, the functionality of the display monitor registers, 
your your d your d d or your, I'm sorry your d d s r your display status register same to similar to what you see in the keyboard that will be one bit bit 15 this is used for status so it's check to see if the device is ready to display and your ddr your display data register they are eight bits or one byte bit zero through seven this is used to store a character that's written or typed in. Questions? So now we understand what's really behind the scene when you're using your input and output and we just simply just you know, touch on keyboard and monitor, right? But understanding the basic with those simple devices, we can expand that to other important output devices. Okay, any question for eight and nine? You can find this again in your notes. Okay, so let's come back here. So earlier we mentioned that there will be polling and interrupt. Okay, and then we're gonna come back to that also later on when we cover chapter 10, which is in a few weeks. So these specific locations for our architecture, which is ISA are used for keyboard and the other locations are used for your monitor. And so to really simulate that, you can also look at page four, right? From the start where, when the user input a character, when your character is typed, ASCII code because it needs to convert it. The ASCII code is then stored in the KDDR, which is bit zero through seven. And then the front bits eight through 15, they are zero. Then the 15 is then set to one. So that means that it receives a character. Then the keyboard is disable so the type character will be ignored okay so if it's set to one then it's ignored if it's set to zero then it's ready okay so all that is on electrical signal is, is that you know when i i have full signal which is a one right your any type character is ignored okay so when you're not when you're writing the program and you you're not telling it to receive any kind of instructions, even when the user touched the keyboard, it's not going to register that, right? So in behind the scene, that bit 15 is then set to one. But when it's set to zero, then it's going to li listen and wait for what's being input, a character. And when it receives that character, that character goes into bit zero to bit seven. And so that you would see here, the data goes in the back. In the front, the ready bit, that one bit is set to either one or zero. So when we're looking at the routine for this, right? How the processor pull is that it's going to check, right? And all that is is a condition. So it would say, is there a new character? Yes or no? Okay. If it is a yes, it's going to read the character and then reset the bit. If it's a no, it's just turn on the one and ignore everything else. Okay. So when we write this in assembly, it's gonna look something like this. You would use a label, 
And we don't need to do this in this class, but I want to use this example so you can see. We would do like a poll, and then we're going to load the register zero, right, to a label that has that address. Okay. And then we are going to branch because, you know, it's a condition. So we're going to branch when it's zero, positive, to pull. And then we're going to load, okay, the data. Because if it's yes, it has to read the character and store that character. So if it branch yes, right, uh, when it branch no, zero or positive, then we're going to come back. It's just going to wait. Okay, and and if it's negative, if it's outside of zero and positive, it's gonna listen for the data. It's gonna store the data. So it's gonna put that here. Okay, and so that's how you do it in assembly. We don't need to do this for this class, but when you, if you pursue this, right, if you become assembly developer, you will likely have to work with smart devices that have input and output, and you will likely need to, to program some of that, okay? So in implementation, what we would see for your processor, and this come back to what we talked about with gates and devices and so on, right, with the operation. So when we map this, your address control logic is used. What it does is going to load the address from the memory to those register. And registers are temporary, very much like what you've seen in the register that we've been using in the program. So when it needs to utilize a certain address, it needs to bring that address to the register. And that's how it's going to be able to control the logic with that. Okay, so I'm just summarizing that when you're looking at this. And so with that, what you would have is your memory address, right? Register, that's going to load to the address logic controller. And that's how it's going to trans, it's going to use that to transfer that to the actual memory location. And so when you have an input, you need to have a status and the data. So the status, it's going to have the zero signal waiting for the input. The input comes in, right? It's that's gonna be the data. And it's gonna go through the, the MUX or the multiplexer for the input. Okay. Then the address needs to be loaded to be able to handle the data that comes in and reset the status. Okay, so we need to use the address logic uh, control logic and it's gonna load the the actual address, which is the location to be able to handle that from the memory. Okay. So now when you need to do echo routine, so when you input a character that you need to really display it right away on screen, okay? So for example, you ask the user to input, you know, a letter, of their, their initial, for example, for your program. We want to input and then display right away. So you would similarly what you've seen in the last program, but we repeat the process, okay, for both. So poll one is going to be for your keyboard. Poll two is going to be for your display. And then we would fill the pointer to the register location, okay? keyboard and mon and display. So you would load to the register zero for the label that fill to those the addresses. Okay, and then you would branch as they are conditions. Listen, right? Receive, yes, no. And so that's how you would do that for your display and, and keyboard. Okay, and so this is what we've seen with the keyboard and that's just extended with the display monitor.
And as we touch on the, the, the DSR and the DDR, right, similar to what you see with the keyboard, you have the front bit, bit 15 for the ready bit, and then the data is from zero to seven. This byte is gonna handle the data. Everything else in between is zero. So when it pulls, it simply checks, right? Is the screen ready? And so if it is, then show the character. And so if it's zero, then it shows the character. If it's one, then it's just gonna ignore whatever happens next, okay? All right. So when the device needs attention of the processor, it generates an interrupt. So when you, you see this a lot in Windows environment. So for example, like I have an application that's running and it's not responding to, to certain things, right? When you force something to be executed or, or a halt or something like that, you generate an interrupt. And so therefore it needs to stop, you know, stop whatever it's doing and give the attention to that the, the device. Now your processor have multiple core, so it's gonna use one of the core to handle that while the other core is gonna do other things that you are running on your computer now, right? So a good example for this is, let's say I'm running an application and it's not responding to me. For example, I open up my browser and my screener is kind of blank. I'm not seeing anything, but I hit control alt delete on my Windows system. And all of a sudden it generates that interrupt because at that point when I hit control alt delete, those are the hotkeys or the the um, function keys to, right, to, to, stop what the uh, some of the processes in the back. And so when that happens, it generates an interrupt signal. It's going to show me, right, the option so I can go to task manager or whatever to control my task. And sometimes you would see these type of interrupt, right? You can force certain execution to pause or stop, and that will generate an interrupt. Because when you're running an application, your processes are already being queued based on what's happening next in that application, right? It's already mapping out like what's the next step. And so it's loading that to the queue and then eventually to arithmetic logic unit with the MAR and, um, and so on, okay? So when I, I generate a, a, an interrupt to halt, right? So what that does is it's going to pause it, right? It's going to stop some execution and it's going to bring in. And so the OS is designed to prompt me some kind of menu so I can access my, my task bar, uh, my task manager and so on. So then when that happens, it issue the IRQs or the interrupt values. Okay, so when you use polling, polling requires a lot of resources because it needs to constantly check and there are systems that constantly pull, okay? Do you know which system that you're using to constantly pull right now in your home? Your wireless router constantly advertises itself, right? and it's waiting, listening for the device to be connected to it, okay? There are communication systems that constantly pull each other to see what's available. So when you're using the internet connection, you know, the, the industrial routers, what they are is they're checking one another to see, hey, are you available? How many, how much stuff do you have? Um, should I pass it to you or should I pass it to the other guy, my neighbor, right? So all of these things are happening and those are all computing systems. So what they are is they're, they're just checking each other list and see, oh, hey, 
if that neighbor is busy, I'm going to pass it to the next guy. That's how you're able to get faster internet connection by polling and queuing. Okay. So in this in the computer, it's similar to that. But when you pull, you constantly have to keep the cycle. And so therefore it requires resources. Okay. And it needs to collect status and update updates from you know whatever it's pulling, all your devices, your I.O. If you implement the interrupt mechanism, we just need to generate a signal, right? That would draw the attention for the CPU. And we want to be able to make it where the CPU can test whether that interrupt signal is set or not. Okay. And in that, we would also find ways to make it where there would be a priority. So when I generate an interrupt, there should be some form of priority. How does it handle right, the mouse versus the keyboard versus the monitor and other things? So think of it like in a classroom, right? Uh, the teacher would say, raise your hand if you need my attention. So the device would generate a signal when it needs to interrupt. But if everybody raises their hands at the same time, how does the teacher determine if which one has priority? So there needs to be a mechanism to make sure that there has to be some kind of ranking in priority, okay? And so earlier I mentioned that when you do control alt delete, right, it generates some kind of interrupt and that's software set interrupt enable. And so when that happens, that bit is activated. Okay. So when the ready bit is set, it generates an interrupt signal. So as I hit control alt delete, it's going to give the attention to the keyboard. So it activates that bit, which is bit 14 next to the ready bit. And so therefore it's gonna send the signal to the processor. Now it's gonna use, uh, it's gonna use priority level. So in LC3 or in ISA architecture, you would have different priority level from level zero through level seven. So you do have eight priority level. And every instruction can be executed based on different level of urgency. So by using right PL zero through PL seven, we can distinguish the routines priority level. So the encoder would select the highest priority device and compare that to the current processor priority level. And the generates and it generates interrupt signal if appropriate. So as it it generate before it generates the interrupt signal, it needs to go through the comparison process to make sure that what's current, right? And so in, in, the, in the Windows system, when you do control alt delete, it generates an interrupt signal. We know that, but it then move that prior interrupt to the highest level. So everything else does not matter anymore. You can move your mouse, but then you know, or you can you can do other things, but then it it would pay, give the attention to the task that's being next, or uh, the keyboard first, and then it's gonna show the monitor. It's gonna show the menu for the options that you need to select task manager. So here they're giving you a general example. If payroll program runs PL PL zero and another program runs PL6, then it's okay for PL6 device to interrupt PL0 because, but not the other way around because PL0 is lower ranking, okay? 
compared to PL6. Okay. So it would go through what we would see as the store and fetch phases. If it's not set, it's going to continue to the next instruction and, you know, as it goes through. But if it's set, it's going to transfer the control to the interrupt service routine, which is it, which has a different functionality. So when the inter the interrupt signal is received, then it's going to handle the interrupt service routine. All right, so let's come back to the assignment now. We are going to answer question 10. So how does the CPU handle priority from IO devices? There are two ways that it, it, it handles that. One is by polling, where it's going to keep checking on the, the devices. Second is by looking by using interrupts where the device would send the signal to the CPU when data arrives or when it's ready for the next data. Well, we only have 10 questions to, to address in this assignment. I want to continue and finish up the notes. Right, this chapter is fairly short and easy. So we can tackle that. And I encourage you to read the chapter. And I all I also uploaded the PowerPoints. I used some of the diagrams from the PowerPoint to show you simulation, but the chapter does go into the details explaining all of these things. Okay. Any question regarding question 10? Okay, so here it talks about how, how there would be a signal between store and fetch faces. And we talked about how it would set for the next instruction. And here's the diagram. So if the, the interrupt signal is, is generated, then it's going to transfer that to the ISR. If it's not, then it's going to go and fetch it again. So do the program have an inherent priority status if, yes. If the program has input and output, there are programs that don't require um, much input and output or much input and output devices, right? So for example, you, you know, I can have a program. So it in general, when I say much means that, you know, we can have minimal, we can have things that just displaying on screen and it just keep looping, right? So it's going to reuse the monitor over and over and over again. But in general, yes. Okay. To really answer that question. So the processor, it constantly um, is only, it's always going to fetch and store and then it's going to check and it's going to wait for interrupt signal. Okay. So if it's not, then it's just going to go to the next instruction and the next instruction. But we use the computer system in a way where we constantly would have input and output one way or another because we have to see data on the screen or we have to enter some kind of data right into the system. Even when you're looking at automated system, right, it needs to talk to other system or operate some kind of functionality. And the way that we want to check that is we want to generate some kind of report that it's doing its job, right? Or if it's coming across any kind of error. So you do have internal input and output with that, whether it's outputting to a storage drive or it's showing that on screen or printing it out or something like that, okay? So, and I call the processor the busy parents because it's, you know, as it's not receiving anything, it's going to come back and fetch and, and go through the process over again. And then if it does, then it, it transfer that and then it's going to wait for the data and it's processed the data, clear the bits, and then it goes through the process again.
Okay. Um, so for the interrupt in the implementation for the memory mapping, so this is what you would see. Okay. And now for your keyboard, right, your status. So when you input with the keyboard, that goes into the multiplexer. Your status gets updated, right? That gets sent here. Then it's going to go through and it's going to put that into the memory address register that gets loaded for the memory. Then your general register is used. Then it comes here and in order for it to be output on the, the display or the monitor side, it has to go through this process again. And then eventually the load the address. The address logic controller is then going to be sending out signal to your uh, status register for the display monitor. Are you ready? I'm sending you some data. And then it says, I'm ready. When it receives that, that signal, then it's going to take that data and transfer it to the DDR. And that's how it shows on the monitor. Okay. So when you have the input, and if you want to display that input as a character on a monitor, this is what's happening. And we do this on the user side constantly, right? When you're checking your phone, when you are using your computer now for class, um, you know, when you are accessing the internet uh, and so on. We we use it so often and, and all of this is happening in the back. So now you see how IO is used um, at the low level, okay? All right. Any question? Okay, so fairly short chapter. We're finishing a little early today. Um, so I'm gonna end the session a little earlier today, but I'll stick around for questions or comments or any concern. Um, and so let me stop recording.